Calling All Cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 250 at Wilshire and Western. Assist the officer. That's all. Road you. Supposing a friend of yours were crossing the street, and you could see that his next step would plunge him into an open manhole with possibly serious injury. As a friend, you'd call out to warn him of his danger, wouldn't you? Well, friends, in that same spirit, I'm calling out to those of you who are flirting with another kind of misfortune, probably without knowing it. Don't court the financial disaster of motor failure or premature breakdown by trying to get by with flabby, short-lived oil. Just think of all the friction-resisting, heat-defying real lube you could have bought with that last repair bill. Just try to break real lube down with your highest speed. Even with the help of a sometimes hot-tempered weatherman, it can't be done. Here's how you can prove it to yourself. The next time you drive into the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood for a tank full of police car performance Rio Grande cracked, take aboard a crankcase full of real lube. Drive a thousand miles. Then look at your oil gauge. Then feel the still great film strength and body of this best lubricant. And I can hear you saying... That was the straight dope Dr. Lindsley gave us the other night. This real lube is the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. The story of the artful Dodger is to be found in the confidential files of the Los Angeles Police Department. We have therefore requested Chief of Police James E. Davis to open our program. Chief Davis. One of the most elusive criminals that my department has ever had to deal with is the story of the man we are to hear tonight. He was one of the hardest men to capture and convict that we have dealt with. He had a criminal record that began in 1911, and yet he had never been held in prison longer than two years, in spite of the fact that he had received sentences of 15 years, seven years, and in one case, a sentence of one year to life. He was apparently an intelligent man who should have known better, but he had convinced himself that he could lead a life of crime and make it pay. How he was dissuaded from this idea will be revealed as our program progresses. I shall have further facts to give you at the end of the show. On a bleak day in December, Captain Chitwood of the Narcotic Detail sat talking to a newspaper reporter. Pity the poor peddlers on a day like this. I don't pity the peddler on any day, but I would like to put my hand on the guy who's supplying this dope. Mister, I wouldn't go out after the guy who makes all the narcotics in Los Angeles in a rain like this. Now, what's this story you had to tell me? Well, this guy, Courtney, has got a fake automobile insurance racket that he's operating out here at Western and Wilshire. But I've got a hunch that that so-called business is only a blind. What makes you think so? Well, the grand jury is investigating him, and uh, there hasn't been an entry in his ledger in two years. What else have you found out about him? This bird was picked up in 28 on a fugitive warrant from Chicago, but for some screwy reason, Chicago turned him loose. Wait a minute, Bill. I want to get his record. Will you go down to the record division and get the file on Don Courtney right away, please? You haven't told me why you think this fellow's peddling dope. Well, in the first place, his brother Ed is a known addict. Well, I'm beginning to connect this up now. This Ed Courtney is a brother of a guy they call Dapper Don, isn't he? That's the one. Yeah. We've had Ed in here several times, but we've never been able to prove anything on him. Well, I think this is the time they're going to do it. He runs around with a fellow who's a chauffeur for one of our glamour girls out at Paramount. And while she's inside running the gamut of her emotions from A to B, the chauffeur is outside using her car to pedal dope. Does our friend Courtney work with him? All the time. Courtney and the chauffeur live together in the same apartment. Well, where do you and your paper come into this picture? Well, I think this guy, Courtney, is pulling a lot of rackets around here, and there's something screwy about the way he gets away with it. We're willing to stand part of the expense, if... If what? If you'll promise to give me an exclusive on the story. Carter, have you gone crazy? Sure, I ought to let you catch your crooks yourself. Yeah, well, it has been done, you know. Yeah, sure. But don't try to kid me, Eddie. You know, and I know, that you haven't gone after this fellow because you haven't the money to build up the case. Don't forget, I read the budget recommendations, too. Oh, all right, all right. How do you want to work it? My people will put up enough money to rent an office next door to Courtney's. There's a vacant office in the building that joins the one that Courtney has his in. We can plant a dictaphone in there, and maybe we can get a line on them. Here's Courtney's record, Captain. Oh, thanks, Paul. You know Charlie Carter, don't you? Yeah, but we call him Nick. <laughs> <laughs> that ought to be a good name for him. 
He's going to play detective for a while. Oh, that's so? What's up? Uh, we're going to try to get the goods on Don Courtney. Oh, it's a good trick if you can do it. Yeah, this guy's got enough aliases to start a jail of his own. All right. He's been picked up as Regan, Osborne, Batir, and as Charlie Struce. And on everything from grand larceny to extortion. To say nothing of robbery, escape, and bond jumping. And you can add contributing to the delinquency of a minor and grand theft bunco. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he's a model citizen, I suppose. Oh, yes. Complete with spats, carnation, and cane. <laughs> so that's where he gets the dapper Don stuff. Huh? That's right. Carter, I don't think you've told me everything. Just why is your scandal sheet so interested in this gentleman? Well, Eddie, I will tell you. Did you ever hear of the Bilkins Investment Corporation? No. That's a suggestive name, though. You've no idea. Ever hear of the Minority Stockholders Committee or the Lincoln Realty Landowners Committee? The answer is still no. Did you ever hear of the Cincinnati Realty Corporation? Well, certainly. Perfectly legitimate firm of subdividers. Yeah, that's right. So legitimate, in fact, that our friend Dapper Don was able to cause them so much trouble that they had to get an injunction from Judge Dorn to keep him quiet. How come? Well, it seems our Dapper friend was carrying on a whispering campaign. Is that so? What was he whispering about? Well, it uh, turns out that the Cincinnati people were developing a new track. And our friend Courtney wanted to get his hands on it. So mm. he formed the Cincinnati Realty Corporation Lot Owners Recovery Commission. Mm. Sounds important. It was important to the Cincinnati people. Just what was Mr. Courtney going to do for the lot owners? Well, he convinced some of the owners that they'd made bad investments when they bought lots. He told them that he had a lot of money invested in the tract and that he was representing the minority lot owners. And he could help them get the money back. For a consideration, no doubt. Naturally. His minimum fee was 10% of the original investment. My gosh, that's high. Nothing cheap about Dapper Don. Of course, when the Saps found out that their investment was perfectly safe and with a legitimate company, it was too late. Dapper Don had their 10% and they had nothing. What was the big idea behind all this? There's somebody back of him with money who wanted that track to land. And they figured the simplest way to get it was to run the owning company into bankruptcy. Oh. Well, that's been done before. Yes, and it's being done again on a building and loan up in Hollywood. Well, why doesn't somebody tell the grand jury about these My things? My friend, your lack of sophistication amazes me. Not only has the grand jury been told, but so has the Corporation Commission. And Dapper Don goes merrily along, still whispering. Yeah, so you want me to go out and pick him up on a narcotics charge, huh? I don't care what you pick him up on, so long as I get the first interview with him. Okay, Tom Swift, get your wireless machine, let's go. That's Courtney's office right over there, across the air shaft. The one with the Venetian blinds in it. Doesn't look like a very big layout. Uh, that one and the one adjoining it. We're going to have to put dictaphones in both of them. What's the matter with tapping the telephone? It's illegal. So what? So we're not going to do it. Oh, so you're going to do it the hard way. That's right. You're getting like Horatio Alger. Yeah. Hey, it looks like somebody's sitting on Courtney's desk. Yeah. That's where the delinquency of the miner comes in. Mm. Hey, what time does this guy go home? Well, about ten minutes. He's on schedule. You know all the answers, don't you? I've been working on this case. Uh, does the blonde go with him? Well, usually. Nuts. You're going to have to be what is known as agile to get over there. No trick at all. I've done it lots of times. You're going to get shot climbing in windows someday. What does that guy do here this late at night? Oh, I'm surprised at you. He makes telephone calls. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I know. Two minority stockholders. Wait a minute. There they go. He runs through the form and leave a light on. Well, that'll help. He, uh, he's getting thrifty. He turned it off. Any chance of he's coming back? He never has before. How about night watchmen here? Well, a couple of door rattlers that make the rounds about once an hour. All right, let's get over there. Powell, you go get the car and bring it around the back door, and one of us will let you in. Okay, Eddie. Okay, news hound, let's go. Better watch those telephone wires. I tripped over them the last time I came across here. Hey, you're a regular housebreaker, aren't you? No, 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 just a private investigator. Yeah, yeah, I know. Nick Carter, the boy detective. Now, if we can just get this window up, we're set. Ah. See? There's nothing to it. Hmm. Not a very impressive setup. Serves his purpose. What does he call this joint? It's the Metropolitan Automobile Association. How about all these other companies he's supposed to represent? Just stick around. You'll find out about them. Hey, have you talked to the Bunko Squad about this? Mm, no, we can do that later. They might not want to string along with the paper. Well, we better go down and let Powell in. Come on, there's a rear entrance fire escape down here. Doesn't seem to be many officers occupied here. Well, they're not. Just a couple more besides Courtney's. Hey, Harry. Bring your stuff up this way. Okay, but don't make so much noise. I just saw a couple of these merchant's cops down the street. Hope they keep out of sight until we get these dictaphones installed. Yeah, unless they come snooping around, we can tell them we're working for the telephone company. 
Here, give, give me a hand with this. Why yeah. didn't you bring the rest of the communications division? There's enough wire here to wire the whole building. Well, you never can tell what you need. Where'd you leave the car? A couple of doors down the alley. Better close that door. Where, where, where are we going to put those microphones? Under the desk, back of the middle drawer. We'll run the wire under the carpet. Well, we can run the wire right along the telephone line here and we'll be out of sight. Well, there's only one drawback to these dictaphone setups. You can't hear the other end of telephone conversations. And believe me, boy, from what I hear about our friend Courtney, some of those conversations should be worth listening to. What are you looking for? Dope, of course. I doubt if you'll find it around here. I think his brother keeps all the supply. We'll darn soon find out. How about it, Harry? You about through? Yeah, just about. What the devil's that? Oh, I knocked over this cockeyed chair. Now you'll have every door rattler in town up here in a minute. Here, Carter, throw this roll of wire across the air shaft. Come on, let's get out of here. Quiet. I hear someone coming. Probably our merchant police. Yeah, there's a time when night watchmen can be very inconvenient. Who's up there? Nobody, boss, just us chickens. Quiet, you fool. Cross your fingers. Maybe you'll go away. Do you hear me? Who's up there? Got a hammer, Harry? Yeah. Drop it real hard. <laughs> Looks like our friend is completely <laughs> discouraged. He probably got a look at us three thugs. Uh, come on, let's get out of here while we got a chance. Hey, what time does Courtney get here in the morning? About 9.30. We'll be in our office next door waiting for him. Early next morning, the officers arranged for Powell to attempt a buy from Ed Courtney. Chitwood and Carter were listening on receivers in the office the newspaper man had rented. As the hours went by, they heard numerous telephone conversations, mostly of the same pattern. Drexel 0456, Minority Stockholders Committee. Oh, yes, I'm quite familiar with that company. I'll say he is. Well, I'll tell you, old man, I, I'm afraid you've lost your money. No, I wouldn't want to undertake to get it back for you. Well, let's see. I'll tell you what to do. You mail us your check for $49.95, and we'll look into it for you. Well, that's to cover the registration and title search. Hmm. Yes, that's right. Why, absolutely. You'll get every penny of it back. Way back. Yes. Suppose you get in touch with me in about a week. Mm -hmm. That's right. Goodbye. So that's the way he works. That's just part of it. Stick around. Bilkins Investment Corporation, Courtney speaking. Yes? Oh, yes, I know that company quite well. Of course, I wouldn't want you to quote me on this, but my investigators tell me they're due to go on the rocks any day now. Would you get that? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to pick up the morning paper and see where they've filed bankruptcy proceedings. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I couldn't make you any definite promises, but we do represent the minority stockholders, and we're making every effort to get our money back. I see. Well, how much stock have you? Oh, $10,000. Oh, well, of course, you know we charge a slight fee for our services. Yes, about 10%. Huh? Well, of course, if you feel that's a little high, you might stop and consider your chances of getting your money at all. Yes, well, that's fine. I thought you'd see it our way. Oh, yes, we, uh, we require a small deposit in advance, about 5%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fine. Well, we'll send a messenger right over for your check. Goodbye. Say, this guy's doing a land office business. You ain't heard nothing yet. From the stories I've been hearing, this guy loses his temper and throws the furniture around if he doesn't clean up five grand a day. Five? Oh, go on. There aren't that many suckers. Hold it. Here it comes. Lincoln Realty Land Owners Committee, Mr. Jones speaking. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Now, listen, I told you yesterday when you came down to the office to keep out of here. And I told you to keep away from Ed and not be telling him things. Get to talking to him, and the first time he's all hopped up, he'll spill his insides all over the place. Oh, so Ed takes yeah. dope, huh? Sure, he's a hophead. Oh, but you can't trust him, I tell you. Oh, now, listen, honey, don't be that way. You're just a kid, you know. I don't want you to start running around with guys like Ed. He's not the right kind for you. A lot of brotherly love there. He cut his own mother's throat yeah. for a dime. Yeah, honey, I know, but you're only 18. Well, sure, I'm going to marry you. Didn't I tell you I would? Is that the delinquency you were talking about? Uh, mm, that's it. Well, I'm glad it's out of my department. Oh, listen, baby. I'm throwing a party at the hotel tonight. How about getting a couple of your friends and meeting me there, huh? Who? Why, she's only 16. That, you... Well, all right, bring her along. See, 
You see what I mean? I think I do. Seems to have taken care of that situation. What next? Hello? Oh, what do you want, Ed? It's about time you called. I got a delivery to make right away. Yeah. The fellow at Vine and Sunset wants an ounce, and he's in a hurry for it. How long will it take you? Well, can't you make it in less than half an hour? All right, scram on out there. Oh, uh, whose car are you going to drive? Well, what's the matter with Clara's rolls? I told him you'd be driving that. All right, all right, never mind. Get a hold of Bob and scram on out there. Come on. Looks like Harry's right on the job, doesn't it? Yes, and if we don't want to miss the show, we'll get on it. Stopping only long enough to notify the Bunko Squad and the juvenile authorities, Chipwood and the reporter rushed to Vine and Sunset to be present when Powell made the buy from the suspected pair. See Harry anywhere? Yeah, right down there by the drugstore. Did you give him the money? Yes, yeah, all in marked bills. Now, as soon as Harry pays them the money, we'll hop on the running board and take him in. You don't see a Rolls Royce anywhere, do you? Uh-uh. I don't know what this Bob guy looks like, but I'd know Ed if I met him on a dark night. He weighs two pounds less than a horse. Hey, here comes the Rolls. Looks like they're going to pull into the curb. You spotted Harry? I think so. Yeah, I see him now. He's got the stuff. Come on, let's go. All right, Courtney, let's go. What is this, a stick-up? Never mind, just drive around the corner until I tell you to stop. I don't know what this is all about. I don't know who you guys are. What do you want? We want you to come down to headquarters and have your fingerprints taken. What for? For selling dope without a license. I don't know what you're talking about. Ask your talkative friend over there. Maybe he does. Bob, do you know what they're talking about? I ain't saying nothing. Slightly ungrammatical, but clear. All right, Courtney, give me that money you got for the narcotic you just delivered. I ain't got it. No, but Bob has. Come on, shell out. Uh, give it to them, Bob. Is that all of it, Carter? Let me count it. Yeah, that's all of it. 250 bucks. Is that the same money you gave Harry? It's the money, all right. These are the babies we're after. Where do you get your supply, Courtney? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you don't. How about your brother? Is he handling the stuff? I don't know anything about it. How about it, Bob? I ain't saying nothing. Yeah, I believe you mentioned that before. Okay, drive on. Where to? The city jail, my friend. Uh... <laughs> But Chitwood and his allies had nothing to connect dapper Don Courtney with the charge of dope peddling. The brother Ed obtained his release on bail, and the two Courtney's headed for St. Louis to spend the intervening time before Ed's trial. Meantime, police had arranged to trace the leads that had been obtained from their dictaphone. They brought in two girls for questioning. Uh, I might just as well put my cards on the table and tell you two girls what I want. I'm after Don Courtney on a narcotics charge. I'm afraid you come to the wrong place to get your information, Captain. We don't know anything about Don Courtney. Why, I scarcely know Don at all. I happen to know better than that. I've had calls on Courtney's phone traced to the apartment where you two girls live. I've had men watching your place night and day for several weeks. And if you want to tell me the truth, all right. If you want me to draw my own conclusions, that's all right, too. I have a pretty good idea what's going on. Oh, yeah? Say, what are you driving at? I happen to know that Ruth here is 18. And I also happen to know, Dorothy, that you're only 17. And a couple of Courtney's friends are even younger than you. However, I'm not interested in that angle of the yeah? case. Yeah? Where does that get us? Well, if you want to get tough about it, it gets jailed for you. But if you want to play along with us, we can make it easy on you. Well, what do you want to know? Where's Courtney now? He went to St. Louis with his brother. When will he be back? I don't know. Oh, sometime around New Year's. That's next week, huh? You'll figure fast, don't you? Has Courtney ever given either of you girls narcotics? No. Just a minute. I had enough over that dictaphone one afternoon to send both of you girls to jail. What did you hear? Well, I heard about a little crap game that you played with Mr. Courtney. I also heard him promise you an ounce of morphine as a bonus. So that's where he was that night. Say, I ought to knock this game's block off. Oh, you, you didn't know about that, huh? I'll tell you plenty about that lug. No, you won't. Because if you do, you'll get yourself in jail. So are you. Oh, no, I won't. Take a look at that. Why, why, you dirty double baby sister. Hey, Savage. what's so interesting in that paper? Read it yourself. My, 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 a marriage certificate. I suppose you're going to stand on your rights and not testify against your husband. That's right, Copper. I'm Mrs. Don Courtney, and I'm going to stay that way. And there's nothing you or anybody else can do about it. If you read that sheet of paper carefully, you'll see my mother was one of the witnesses. Now, what does that do to your case? You forget there's still Dorothy. I don't think you'll find Dorothy so willing to talk. Will he, Dorothy? Oh, enough to it. 
save your breath, copper. Hey, Paul. What is it, Chief? Take these two femmes du pave out of here and keep them out. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Amy. Come on, get along, you two. A week later, on the morning of New Year's Day, Captain Chitwood, Lieutenant Harry Powell, and four other officers drove to the railroad station in Pasadena to serve as a reception committee for the incoming Courtney and his brother. Here he comes, boys. Watch him now. He's tough. Smithy, keep your eye on the train and see if his brother gets off on that side. If he does, upside and Luckenbeck will get him. Robinson, you watch the back platform. Harry, come with me and we'll pick up Don. Are you still going to try to pin a narcotic rap on him? Yeah, we can't seem to get anybody interested in getting him on anything else. The Corporation Commission didn't do anything about his whispering campaign? No. There's something fishy about that bird, but I can't find out what it is. He knows too many people. Yeah, maybe he's got a good lawyer. Well, that wouldn't get him out of all his jams. Wait a minute, I, I see him. He's fixing to get off. Okay, let's keep this quiet now. Where, where's Carter? He's over there all set with the photographer. All right, Mr. Courtney. Take it easy now. What? We're police officers and you're under arrest. Oh, yeah? Well, what's the charge? Suspicion of narcotic violation. What? Don't make me laugh. We'll try not to. Take a look in those bags, Harry. Okay. I'll get you for this shit with you. Yeah, I thought it was about time you said that. How about it, Harry? Pretty good, Eddie. Two forty-five automatics and enough dope to send him to jail for the rest of his life. Now, look, you're making a mistake, coppers. Those, those are not my bags. No, whose are they? They, uh, they belong to my brother. What? Hey, Harry, there's Courtney's brother in the vestibule. Grab him. Okay, Chief. Get that train into Los Angeles and bring him in. Don't waste your time, copper. You can't make this rap stick. Maybe you're right, but I'll take a chance on it. Although Powell searched every part of the train where he thought Ed Courtney might be hiding, the fugitive was not to be found for the simple reason that he had bribed a train employee to hide him in an upper berth. Don was led off and booked, but next day was out on bail, breathing threats against the police. Then, mysteriously, four days later, Brother Don surrendered Ed. Then started a story of the law's delays. Ed and his companion, who had been arrested carrying the marked money which the newspaper reporter had given Powell for the purchase of narcotics, had been released with ridiculously light sentences. Dapper Don managed to delay his tra- trial time, time after time. And while he delayed, he was busy fixing things. Having already married one potential witness, he now managed to have the girl Dorothy disappear, and while a charge of tampering with witnesses was being considered, any hope of obtaining a conviction on a moral charge was shattered when the case was quietly dismissed. Insufficient evidence hampered the pressing of bunco charges. Courtney complained bitterly that newspapers and the publicity given his case had wrecked him financially. Then he sank to a lower form of crime, extortion. Good morning, sister. Tell your boss I want to see him. I'm very sorry. But Mr. Sullivan is quite busy right now. Would you care to wait? Just take this envelope into him. I think you'll see me. Yes, sir. And never mind opening it. He can take care of that himself. Yes, sir. I'll be right back. You're telling me. Mr. Sullivan will see you, Mr. Courtney. Yeah. I thought he would. Hiya, Sullivan. What do you want around here? You read my note? Yes, you lousy rat. I read it. Well, I see you got my picture, too. Where'd you get this picture? Wouldn't you like to know? I intend to. Ah, come on. Let's cut out this child's play and get down to business. I admit you beat that rap on that morals case of yours. But how do you think the DA would like to see that picture? You've got a lot of gall, but you haven't got nerve enough to do that. You're ripe for a little investigating yourself. Oh, yeah? It might be interesting for the district attorney to know how you beat your raps. <laughs> Maybe you would, Mr. Sullivan, but I'm afraid a man in your position can't afford to squeal on a guy like me. All right. What's your proposition? Now you're talking. I need 2,000 bucks and somebody to square a beef with the Bunko Squad. I'm a lawyer. I'm not in the beef squaring racket. Besides, what do you think I'm going to get $2,000 to give you? Remember them bonds I spoke to you about? Go ahead and sell them. The ones that you and your pals stole in Philadelphia? Yeah, that's the one. I told you once I wasn't going to touch those. They're hot. You can take your filthy picture and take it to the district attorney, and you can do whatever you want with it. I bet you you wouldn't like for me to show that picture to your wife, I bet you. Listen, Courtney, someday I'm going to take that carnation out of your buttonhole, and I'm going to put it right on your nose. Oh, yeah? And then I'm going to mash it through the back of your head. (laughs) Why, Mr. Sullivan. Mary, did you make that call I told you to? Yes, Mr. Sullivan. How about it, Sullivan? Mary, write out a check for Mr. Courtney for $2,000 and bring it in here for me to sign. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. No check, Sullivan. Never mind, Mary. Get the money out of my safe. I'll call you when I want it. Now you're being smart. How about that bunker beef? What's it all about? Just a little matter of some boys in Hollywood who didn't know how to run their business. 
I did a little telephoning now and then, got hold of some of their stock. You see, I represented the minority stockholder. For a consideration, no doubt. Well, 10%, maybe sometimes more. All depend on the sucker. And you expect me to square a beef like that? I not only expect you to, Mr. Sullivan, but I think you will. Just what are you going to do if I don't? Remember, I still have the negative in that picture you have there on your desk. Nothing doing. I expect you to give me that negative when I give you the $2,000. Mr. Sullivan, I know you believe in fairy tales, but... I'm afraid I'll have to keep that negative, just in case. No negative, no deal. Okay, I'll show it to wifey Dyfee. Go right ahead. Go ahead. All right, let's stop bluffing each other, Sullivan. I happen to know you've got your secretary listening in on that inter-office phone. But it isn't going to do you any good because you can't prove a thing. Okay, Courtney. Mary, bring that money in here. Yes, Mr. Sullivan. Well, it looks like you win this time, Courtney. Yeah, I always win. Here's the money, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mary. Here you are, Courtney. Thanks, Sullivan. I always knew you were a smart guy. That's right, Courtney. He huh? is. He was smart enough to call the police when you came in. Now, wait a minute. You ain't got nothing on me, Chip. That's what you think. We've been listening to your conversation on that office phone, and the girl here has stenographic notes on every word you said. I may be a narcotics officer, but I can still take you in for grand theft, bunco, and extortion. Come along. I think the DA wants to talk to you. <laughs> In just a moment, Chief Davis will give us the remaining facts regarding our program. Meanwhile, remember these facts. That Rio Grande Cracked is just another way of saying police car performance gasoline, and that Rio Lube, its companion product, means complete and immediate protection for your motor the instant you step on the starter. For the sake of your motor and your pocketbook, use Rio Lube, the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West, and Rio Grande Cracked, the gasoline that is first in public service. And now, Chief Davis. In spite of Dapper Don's attempts to again clog the wheels of justice, he was nevertheless brought to trial on March 26, 1937. And because of two prior convictions, his sentence resulted in his being sent to Folsom Penitentiary for a period of ten years and an additional sentence of one year to life. His was another crime that did not pay. Thank you, Chief Davis. Attention all cards. A cancellation of broadcast 250. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and blood. 